getting back to the rules, Mark, I was wondering um, if you think the women's game would be more exciting for you to watch with one set of rules or the other. Would, would the international rules, do you like the international game better because of that than the collegiate women's game? I'm, I'm not an expert on on how women's volleyball looks either either or. So um, I find it, I conceptually, I find it very weird that that Libros can surf. So that's the, that's one part of it. Um, I, my experience is mostly in Europe and I recently had a discussion with, uh, it was actually a, a round table about Libros and the, the question came up if, uh, if Libros should be allowed to serve in European competition and junior competitions. And uh, there were a couple of other coaches on the, on the panel who worked in women's volleyball. And so they were, they were coaching or working with American professional players who had come from college and they straight away, they said no, uh, because they have a really big issue with the, um, American players coming to Europe and being great blockers and attackers, but literally not being able to serve the ball, mm -hmm. to keep the ball in play because they've never done it for their entire 15 years of playing. And, and I, there's an argument that it's not where my opinion's not interesting, but there is an argument I think that says that it, it hinders, um, it hinders the development of the national team to have um, players who, who reach the national team level without being able to play the international skills of the game. So as, for, as far as whether it would make me watch more likely to watch the game, uh, <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't answer I, that. I, I think the one thing that might shift it more in your favor, Mark, is if, you, if there are less substitutions and it forces more six rotation players, which could lead to more attacking out of the back row. Now you're back to the days of having five attackers. Well, four, if the Libro's in perhaps, yeah. um, if you're not having a bunch of defensive specialists and they're taking outside hitters and, and, and opposites out of the back row, yeah. no side of the offense. Uh, I hadn't thought about that part of it, but obviously, yeah, if you, if you have more defense, if you have a defensive specialist and a Libro that, that reduces some, a lot of opportunities. But what I've actually written about before in men's volleyball, the libero actually restricts the offense in a sense. So it, it makes reception better, but it's one less uh, attacker. So you know, when, if, you, if you watch volleyball from the sort of early 90s, there was a period in men's volleyball in the early 90s where there was a, a lot of relatively a lot of variation in attack where they would some on occasions have five available spikers. And, um, and you don't see that anymore just because, um, because the liberos on the court, there are not five available attackers. So, um, you know, that part, that part makes a difference. One thing that would make me watch more women's volleyball is actually if there were more hours in the day. <laughs> I watch I watch so many games now I actually was joking recently that I watch more full games this year than I have in any other season because um, when I'm preparing match or preparing game plans and such I watch parts of games or I watch a hundred attacks of one player um, but this year I'm actually just sitting and watching games from start to finish and more than I ever have before. And then uh, I don't have time to watch the, the women's games that come up. Uh, is, so you could, you could perhaps react to this. One of the things that Ruth Nelson has often talked about is the perceived innovations that have happened in the sport, whether it's a slide attack or combination plays or, or whatever, that you know, a newer generation will look at and go, oh, they'll think that's something that was that people just started using when if you go back to the late 60s and early 70s, no, they were actually doing that sort of stuff. It just wasn't 
nobody was watching it on television back then. So unless you were actually going to matches, which was uh, uh, unfortunately a minority of people in the population in those days, you didn't see the innovations that were happening. Well, if, if you just look at the team that I played on in 1969, um, and we and Moo Park was the, our coach for the Renegades for the club team, we were doing everything that those uh, teams were, those Asian teams were doing at that time. And that was a huge influence if we're going back to Chuck Irby and, and Chuck coaching that early team, that's what Chuck brought back to this country. And those were the all, they weren't using the slide very much, but using all the different combination plays and quick and quick hits, that was common then. And um, so we were doing a lot of different things early on. And actually, I think more things were being done then than actually are being done now. There, there's been a simplification of the offense in in the women's game. Um, I think we did a lot more and, and varied things. We talked about that when we had this conversation last time, talking about the innovations of, of um, the Polish team, Wagner, or, or, or mm -hmm. what, you know, the changes that that he made. So um, I think we're going to a more simplification of the offense rather than um, the complications of it. But um, part of that is because of the back row hit definitely in the men's game. Part of it is because coaches want to exert control. Um, part of it is uh, part of it is, is rule changes. So I was actually, as you were talking, I had already started thinking about the, the Polish team because the, and I was even talking about this yesterday with somebody, the, the, the pipe as the second attack on the second contact. So where the setter takes the first ball and, and plays it directly to position six who attacks the second ball. And this is in men's volleyball, it's, it's come up in the last five or six years. And um, it's, it's not used, it's still not used a lot, but it's, it's common. And it, it seems really new, but in the Polish team, Wagner's team, they played under a different set of rules. So in 1976, the block still counted as the first contact. And they, their set play was when the block touched the ball, they played the ball high. They didn't play it fast, but they played the ball high into the middle and position six was, was the attacker for... Um, there and the the matches are on youtube and and i by accident not by accident but i i watched the that olympic final from 1976 and it sort of jumps out at you and said well you know there are 5000 engapet urban engapet clips of him spiking the second ball but in 1976 everybody and their dogs did it so you know it's a uh, it's look back at some of the, the rules that have changed and and it's interesting whether we should bring back some of those rules but I, I've often said with the to vary our offense a lot more now that's one of the things that I think we should do for one I think the middle hitters should be able to hit more balls in um, out of system play and that's exactly what the Polish team was doing at that mm -hmm. time because the middle was more involved. And because the, the block touch counted as the first contact, you had to do something you know, differently. When I was in Japan uh, one year, a play that I saw a club team do, which I'm surprised that no one has really done more, was to pass the ball low to the setter because at that time, a lot of the passes were lower to have the offense run a little more quickly. So they pass the ball to the, to the setter, and they would have a, a call that they would call out, which indicated that the setter wasn't going to set that ball. The middle hitter was hitting the pass, and that was on a perfect pass, not, not an out-of-system play. And that was, that was great, and it was really deceptive. I've heard of that, but I've never seen it. It works pretty effectively. Yeah, I, I, 
one of the conversations that we had, John, was were was talking about it, and apparently there's some there's some YouTube clips there's with Japan playing in the men's team at least playing in the '60s where you can see that action, and I oh. I tried to scroll through fast to catch one, but but I didn't. But I've seen the I've read about it in Matsudaira, Matsudaira's book and oh, yeah. and some pictures, but I've never seen it in action. I've used it in training medals, but I haven't actually had them do it in a game. But that's, that's you know, you know, ideas for for future training. Uh. <laughs> oh, but I think if we, to your comment, John, I think that we can look, or, or or Mark, we can look at the the past and see a lot of the things that um, have already been done that people today. And I laugh to myself when coaches tell me they're doing all these new things and I'm thinking, well, I did that in 1970, but, <laughs> but I'm not yeah. gonna, you know, bring that up. So I think we can learn a lot from the past. Um, and I think people, people would, if they took advantage of that, it could really help their coaching a lot. Well, and the other thing I would throw in there is, and, and this kind of speaks to, to Mark, what you said about coaches control. Um, but maybe perhaps in an inadvertent sort of way is coaches perceptions of what's effective and how that influences things, how that spreads out. I, you know, I think back to, there was a, a middle named Kachi Amani who played for Penn state a number of years ago. I'm forgetting exactly when it was, but she was a six rotation player. This is, I'm pretty sure this was pre Libro and she attacked out of the back row extremely successfully. And the women's game went through a long period of time where nobody thought back row attacking could be effective. And I'll, I'll, I'll blame GMS a, a bit for this because they've kind of been in that camp. But there are hitters out there, and, and, and obviously there, there's a physicality element to it. But it can, if you watch it, it can be effective. I, I was in Switzerland last year as part of the, the two months I spent over in Europe, and I had a coach ask me, basically at the beginning of his practice, have you ever seen – a back row attack be successful in the women's game. And he's a GMS guy <laughs> or, you know, whatever you not just how disciples probably strong, but he's obviously been educated that way. And I had to tell him, I was like, I just spent two weeks in Spain watching women's professional teams running quite successful back row attacks. If you do it right, it works. If you just try to go high ball into the middle all the time, yeah, you're going to probably struggle. But if you do it right, you've got the athletes that can, can can score. So why you know? So coaches can put blinders on things and and say no, the the rest of it's going to work and, and make itself fulfilling. And I, and I think that leads to the point of coaches really having open minds about what they're hearing and what they're reading. And there is so much information out there now. There has never been this much information that you can get um, on your own. But which of it is is correct, or which of it's correct now? And maybe it was correct before, and that and is not as appropriate now. But if you have an open mind and you can really evaluate everything you see, you're going to get a lot out of it. But GMS had a statistic that they showed at one of the national conventions of why the back row hit by the women was not successful. And I, I think they've changed at, the, at this point, but that was something that they had at that time. Um, so everyone is looking at that going, well, it's not successful. And so it, with a, an, an open mind to evaluate what is out there, you're gonna be much more successful. But it's it can be dangerous. It's it's one of my kind of pet pet thoughts, pet peeves, is that the when you when you watch or observe a team or a um, or a coach in action, he or she does things for a reason, and most of the time the reason is because of their team. And I always come back to Doug Beal, nineteen eighty four that the, the reason that he used two receivers was not because he wanted to be um, innovative or change the game or whatever. The reason was because all of his, most of his players couldn't receive and he only had two receivers. 
So he said, well, I still want to win the game. I, I don't want to play with five receivers just because everybody else does. So we have to figure out a way to play with two receivers. And then everybody else said, well, two receivers is obviously the best way. And, you know, six months later, everybody in the, in the world, everybody and their dogs, to return to our theme, um, is using two receivers, even if they had four receivers or even if they didn't have, which was more common, they didn't actually have two good receivers, but, you know, they'd seen on TV that somebody that you have to play with two and, and that was what they did. And, and people, uh, coaches, people, coaches look at the, the, the thing on TV and say, well, that's the way without considering what the, what the concept is, what the background is, why people have got to that point. And I think the, Technic, technical is is a different point, but tactically, there's definitely stuff that we can look back, and we can there, there's tactics that have been used in the past that are just would be are just as valid now, but have been forgotten because we you know go step by step by step, and every step we take we forget what happened before, and uh, I actually to toot my own horn, spent most of the lockdown watching old games. I wasn't really interested in watching the new ones, so I was doing the, all the games from the 80s that suddenly popped up on YouTube and and um, trying to understand what they were doing at the time. So, for example, while I'm on a roll, the, um, the, the, that US team from 84, they played all their quicks um, on angles. So they never ran their quicks directly at the net. And now in 2020, we see we start to see again the um, not so much angles, but now they add in a, a jumping component. So they jump and land in a different in a different place. So that what you, what we're seeing now is what US team was doing in 1984. That's somewhere along the line people forgot about. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. And that was when we were talking about creative, I was saying creative coaching, and I think we changed the idea a little bit to critical coaching, <laughs> um, critical thinking and creative coaching. And we, uh, we started with the five-player reception pattern. Everybody did it. And then some people started doing four and then everyone did two and then everyone did three and now everyone is doing three. Um, and a lot of teams probably should be doing two because they probably don't have three good passers. Uh, but pe people just copy what's successful and what's being done. And I think on the other side of that is you can look at, as a younger coach, you can look at what the national teams are doing and you can say, whoa, that's the national team, we can't do that. But there are some different things that the national teams do that are probably much easier to do at a lower level because there aren't as many good players. Matchup, for example, could be one. There may only be one, one good hitter. So if you match up your best um, blocker on that hitter, you're going to be real successful. Now on the national team, there's, pro there's three or four good hitters at one yeah. time. Becomes, that's, a, that's a really good example. But you, you can take that information. Um, but that leads me on the roll to, to talking about all-around players because players get so used to being, I'm a right-side player. I play right side. I can't play left side because I'm a right-side player. And, and you really can't utilize some of the very simple but very, very effective tactics if you can only play one position. So it, it's another um, positive point for having all around players and, and going to the international rules and eliminating some of those substitutions. Yeah, Mark, we've talked about the, 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 the issue of specialization, especially in the men's game, that it kind of gets locked in institutionally, where it's very hard to break out of what's already there. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it's only, well, 
whatever you're doing, it's hard to break out of whatever the institutionalized way of thinking way of thinking is. It's just uh, um, the easiest way to be criticised. I'm sure in every field, but in volleyball, most definitely, is to do something that's different from the from the conventional wisdom, from the institutionalized way. So when you call your timeouts, when you make your subs, how you practice, do what warm up exercises you do, they all um, a coach is judged on all of those things. So if you any time you step out to say, you know what, um, I don't think that we should pepper in the warm up or whatever the the thing is, you know the and I people are looking. Oh wait, those guys are. Uh, that coach is he doesn't know what he's doing. What are they what are they warming up? And then, you know, the minute you lose, the the minute you're looking for for a job. Whereas if you at least follow the conventional wisdom, you know, you, you have a, some grace period perhaps. But um what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it was just it was about players getting siloed. Yeah, uh, it, it's the it's the easiest thing for coaches to do as well. And, and part of to talk to the, the, the Doug Beal one again, is that it is logical that more specialization allows a more efficient use of training time. So, you know, it's not, it's not dumb to only use two receivers because, you know, it, it allows you to use training time in a completely different way. So, you know, um, it's all part of it. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. What do you think we can take from the nine man volleyball game and utilize today? History, um, what can we learn from, from that that is pretty much gone? They, they do play a little bit. The nine man game is, is no longer with it. Isn't there isn't there a nine man league somewhere? I want to say in the in the states. Well, I think in San Francisco. I recently saw yeah. TV with a tournament that they had that they have every year. And watching that that tournament, I love that game. And, and I, I have never watched it except for like a you know thirty second clip here and there. I know that in Matsudaira's book and Matsudaira for other people is the was the Japanese coach who won the 1972 gold medal. He was the first, he was the original Doug Bill. Um, that, so he wrote in his book that um, how much they took from nine man volleyball into their, um, into their way of playing because nine man volleyball was, was, in the 60s, as late as the 60s, the most popular form of volleyball in uh, in Asia, Southeast Asia. So, um, for quick attack, first tempo attack was originally from nine man volleyball. So, I can't answer the question because I haven't watched enough. But I'm going to, in the spirit of the topic, I'm going to say yes. There are there is something that we can take from it. And and Matsudara's team at that in that 1972 championship that was called Matsudara Circus, and Matsudara's Flying Circus. Yeah, there was just so much movement and changing of positions where people didn't know where where the attackers were going. That it that that was the the image that that people had. But in the nine man game, there was five players in the front row, and all those people could attack and the setter was in the front row also and you had that one player in the in the middle of the court that was sort of in the suicide position but defensively a lot of balls went there and they could play them but the difference was that they were attacking in every different zone at the net and doing it in in a quick fashion um so i i think we can th that's what we're doing now with fewer players but um, that that game was very exciting because it was difficult to know who was going to attack the ball because it wasn't just one player. They were already in those different positions. Yeah. Well, and obviously, as you had extra bodies, you had extra layers of complexity. 
I would just think about all the, the the different sorts of plays that an NFL team can run based on their combination of player packages. And right. and by and by comparative standards, volleyball has relatively few plays. I mean, we're never going to have a, you know a playbook that's six inches deep, uh, but we can still do a lot of a lot of the same sorts of things that they are attempting to do in creating time and space. But I think that might be a good game to bring back. Um, for a recreational game because you're covering the court well you don't have to you don't have to move quite as much because you're already in that one <laughs> so for for just the general public I think that game could be pretty fun it, I, I, I saw it in person one time when I was doing my cap my cap one uh, I did it at the University of Maryland and the, the coach there at the time, uh, forgetting his name off the top of, of my head, but he was, I uh, believe, a Chinese gentleman. And he brought in a demo group to come in and, and show us, you know, nine man volleyball. And it was, it's fascinating to watch. It's really, it's really exciting. I mean, they're on all different, different spacings and all different timings. And you just, yeah, you never know who's going to hit the ball. <laughs> How, how big is the court? Is it 10 meters by 10 or 12 by 12? I, I think it's just a little bit bigger than the, the court. Yeah, okay. So probably 10 by 10, yeah. Okay. Ah, so a lot more players in a similar space. That, that would make life interesting. So what, what are the rules that you think were most significant in the changing of our game that, that we have had? Or, or most important ones that we've eliminated? Well, I mean, I remember the days of can you block, can you not block the, the serve? Because that seemed to flip-flop every couple of years for a little while there before they stabilized it. Uh, I'm not saying it was any I use in the game, America. but I, <laughs> maybe in America? No, it didn't, it didn't do that internationally? <laughs> internationally, it was pretty clear. On December the 31st, 1984, you could block the serve, and on the 1st of January, 1985, you couldn't do it anymore. So that was, that was pretty clear. Maybe that was just NFL. You guys might have been. And, yeah, that was Federation, high school Federation rules, I guess, that were flipping around. Give me a break, John. <laughs> I think one of the most significant ones was that the touch on the block didn't count anymore. Um, I think that change change the game dramatically but then again mark when you're bringing up the idea of how that was utilized you know by poland maybe maybe that rule wasn't as significant as i thought i mean, i'm i'm thinking about it and the the big ones that come to my mind are the um uh the block and the uh, when they allowed the block to uh to penetrate over the net i didn't see these rules personally but that makes a that makes a really big difference uh bringing the antenna in from they used to be 10 meters apart and then they were nine meters now they're nine meters apart um, well and originally there weren't any because that was isn't that what coleman coleman brought those in yeah. to to play in 74 and in 1974 and coleman did, coleman made the first antennas and okay. they were um where the the poles are like three feet out from from the net and then they were brought in over the sideline yeah. so that i think those rules and then and the first contact with the block are significant i have often i've never uh, i've thought about it for a long long time but i've never um followed through but i had the idea to play to play with the old rules, to have a practice, like a practice session where I put the antenna 10 meters apart. You couldn't reach over the net. The block was the first contact and, and to actually see what, how, what would happen. And I'm pretty sure the rallies would be really, really short because, um, you know, it's much, you know, the, it's much easier to score that way. Well, well, the other one, yeah, was, the other in one terms is, of significance, what about the, the ability to contact with something other than your upper body? I don't think that's significant. I don't think that's really made that much difference at all. Um, the, I, maybe the most significant is the first contact. Is the, the, um, because that's, 
in men's volleyball, that's made a really big difference to the float serve. Mm-hmm. So um, the the ability to take the first ball with your hands um, is is really is really significant with the float serve. And the other thing is with the with defence, the the and it's not only there. I think there are a couple of there's the one rule change to allow double contact. And then there are some other nuances where they change the interpretation of what was a, a held ball. And what that's done over time with defense is that it's allowed defense to come much closer to the much closer to the court because they can play overhead, they can play with one hand, they can play with an open hand. So before it used to be everything with an open hand used to be called a um, a, a fault and now you can rebound the ball off an open hand which is logical you could have before you could before they just used to whistle it and when by bringing the the defense in closer closer in i think that it allows um a lot better defense in certain situations like block cover like um like sort of pinball plays at the net that um you know around the three meter line allows a lot more of that stuff if you go back to if you go back to a game in the early 90s what you'll see with the defense is the is the defenders on the sidelines for example and the the whole middle of the court was perimeter was open yeah i wouldn't call this thing uh, the, the pursuit rule i wouldn't necessarily call that a significant change that this happened over time, but it certainly made some things more exciting. And that really, it's annoying to me that in the in the U.S., at least in the women's game, they, they don't, it's not allowed in the NCAA rules. You're not allowed to go. To run outside the, the Outside line. the court to the other side, yeah. Yeah, beyond the net, beyond the, it's, it's, a, it's a safety thing, which is really stupid because. Correct. I mean, it doesn't, it, it doesn't come into play. I mean, yeah, okay. If you had if you had the old net systems with with guide wires and and things like that that hopefully don't yes. exist anymore, then yeah, it's a safety consideration. And if it's at a juniors tournament where there's a lot le- a lot more stuff close to the to the court, f- fine. But at the at the level of athletes and the athletic facilities that are in play at the college level, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. One of the old rules was that a back row player could come to the net and block. Well, oh, that's American rule. <laughs> What's that? That's an American rule. That was never an international rule. That was never an international rule. But there are there's some uh, there's some clips on YouTube. There's a 1957 YMCA national championships where you can see the the four man block, which is uh, it's really kind of it's really kind of bizarre. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, well, let's. I mean, if we really want to go old school, let's whip out. You know, what's his name's original set of rules for from internet and, and see yeah. if anybody could play that. <laughs> well, go ahead. The one of the people talk about how the the rules are the rules have changed and it makes the game. You know, it's not what it's supposed to be, or it changes mm-hmm. the nature of the game. And I always think back to the original set of rules where. You can. Uh, it wasn't a rebound sport. The original internet was not rebound because you were allowed to dribble. You were allowed to dribble <laughs> from the back court to the front court. You played nine innings. I don't even know how you would do that. But you know, if, if, if uh, three outs and then the other team. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've seen that. I've seen them, but I don't even understand how some of them would be played. And there was so, any number of players on the court. There was any number of contacts yeah. you could serve over the net. When, when you look at the game today, you, it is a different game. It, it's not the same game, and it wasn't meant to be a power game. And now that's the exciting part that we really like, that, that it is that, that type of powerful game. But over the years, if you look at history, the game has gone from a completely recreational game with any number of players on the court and the net was higher. I think it was seven, six. Yeah. Um, 
it, it, it is, it is an, a new game that we've evolved to, but we can look at some of the history and say, good, it's history. <laughs> but we can look at other aspects, as Mark, you, you brought up, that we can learn a whole lot, and we could be using some of those things. And if we based our decisions more on who we have than what, what is out there and currently being done, we would be much more successful. But as you also said, it is tough to make, um, do something that might look like other people aren't doing it. Because if you can be successful doing that, you're a genius and you might get a pay raise. If, if you do something different and it doesn't work, yeah, you're, you're gone. So it's, it's a tough line to... Uh, to I, I might be wrong here, but if if the club volleyball in in US is so important, such a big driver of the sport, and club coaches get their their income is derived from um, membership fees, and they start to do things that are different from the other club, then you know the, there's a an economic um, cost to that, I'm sure. Uh, you know, the parents. I'm not. My kid's not going to get a scholarship if if um, if she's playing both left and right side. That's not not possible. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point because I don't understand why clubs. It's difficult to find middle hitters. So clubs take an outside hitter that's small, that's quick and good, and they put him in the middle. But then they take him out of the back row. Well, that middle hitter will never get a scholarship to be a middle hitter. They're going to get the scholarship to be the outside hitter. But then if they never play back row, um, they're not as marketable. So club, on the one hand, gets the most money because players play, which means if we change the rules and have fewer substitutions, that's going to, that will hurt club because the biggest thing is participation. The second biggest thing is getting the scholarship. Um, so they need to be seen to be successful. Um, so trying different things that are out of the ordinary might be difficult to do. Um, so there's a, a whole realm of, of problems in that. Yeah. 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 It's one thing that I, that I really bemoaned when I was in Texas going to tournaments and seeing that classical situation where, okay, we took the, the the tallest girl we could find, who maybe was only five nine, and stuck her in the middle. And I don't. And maybe they stuck her in the middle when she was fifteen. And I'm watching her when she's seventeen or eighteen, and she's looking looking at being recruited for colleges. And you go, okay, she's a good athlete, but she's never going to be enough to play middle for me in this Division two program or whatever. And you go, you know, if only she had got a chance to be a pin hitter to play defense and to receive serve and, and do some other things, then maybe I could recruit her in a different position. But when you're a college coach and, and you're obviously your, your well-being is determined based on how well you perform, you're not going to take chances. Right. Right. On, the detriment, the detriment yeah. to the players and, and to you as a, as a coach. Um, I have one other thing I, I would like to bring up. Okay. Um, in regard to, to, to history, and it's something that I, because of the pandemic, I only had time to do it, um, and that is put together a history of the university where, you know, I worked at University of California, Riverside, and the sport program and the volleyball program from the time I was there, but also included a little bit from 1954 when the college began and just um, recorded what was happening in those days so that people could look and see what it was like. And, and I think that is a really important concept because as we're talking now, people look at what they have now, girls and women especially, because the programs now are really good, they're thinking this always happened. And when you look back, it wasn't all that long ago when these programs didn't exist at all. And so I put together with, with commentary and pictures 
all of this and I'm going to give a copy to special collections so that history exists. But um, for anyone that's listening, I, I just think it's really important that we preserve the history. And so those, those of you that, that have been involved, I, I think um, that's something that would be um, good, but I, I think it's just really important that, that it's done. And when I look back and I look at my first days of coaching, um, it was very recreational and we served punch and cookies after the matches to the teams. And, and, and I couldn't wait until we got rid of that because if we lost, I did not want to see that team any longer. <laughs> I certainly didn't want to give them anything to eat. And, you know, so, so, and we, we shared uniforms, you know, our uniforms went from volleyball and when that season is over, they went to basketball and then the uniforms went to softball. And there's just a lot of things that were done that people would never would never believe. Yeah, I, 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 when you when you brought up sharing the meal afterwards, I was I experienced that in England, even National League Division One, they would have a, a buffet with the other team afterwards. Um, yeah, that that was a new experience. I'll I'll, I'll have to admit. I, I won't say it was a bad experience. It was just new. Well, I really enjoy it when it's in Hawaii because they really. <laughs> have a banquet after the matches, but other than but that. To, to your point about what what it all looked like before, facilities and equipment and, and uniforms, it, I mean, I think all the players these days should be able to say, oh, you know, how far it's it's gone. But I would also say American players need to see what it looks like in other places, even at the professional level, because there are a lot of pro, semi-pro clubs that don't you have facilities and resources to even to match even a middling division three type college program. And, and so there, I mean, I, with, uh, Kevin Barnett used to bring this up all the time. So when you leave the college ranks in the U S to go pro play professionally with some very few exceptions, you've, you've had the best experience that you're going to get. Everything else is, is downhill after that. The most professional experience. The most professional environment. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. You 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 just left the most professional environment that you'll ever play. Best experience is something. Completely That's yeah. It's a different different standard. But we are very spoiled in the United States because things are done at a, at a level that in other countries oftentimes doesn't happen, and especially with my travels in the third world countries, doing volleyball clinics. Um, and most of the courts are outside, and when it rains, you stop, and when it stops raining, you can start again. Um, and during this pandemic, because we can't go inside, a lot of the exercises now are going out outdoors, and, and I have a group that meets in, in a park, and we're, we were on grass at first, and people were complaining about the grass because it got wet, and it was uneven surfaces. And then we went on to the parking lot. And of course, that's hard. And I'm thinking, I just love being outside. <laughs> I love exercising and being outside. But I'm used to it. I'm, I'm used to it because of my travels and seeing, um, you know, what other people do. Uh, and, and along that, just one other thing that gets way back into this conversation about what's old is new and... <laughs> Um, when I was in Poland, and I think it must it was in the 70s, in the mid-70s, I went to a national team practice, and I saw them dividing the court into thirds long, lengthwise and playing one against one with just setting the ball. And they had competitions, you know, with one person could contact the ball three times, set the ball over the net, and then the other person, and they were – setting the ball and looking across, setting the ball and looking across and seeing where that other person was. And that is now what, um, you know, we call the mini volleyball and doing um, all of John Kessel's games. But that was being done in the mid seventies in, in Poland. And I'm sure it was being done in a lot of other places. Okay. What about Australia, Mark? Was that being done in Australia back then? The very first volleyball practice that I went to in 1981 
was a one-on-one. I played a one-on-one setting game and beat the captain of the team that I was about to join. So, yes, we played those games and it was just a little... I had I had played volleyball before. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, given that your dad ran the federation. Uh, he also he that that guy became also an Olympic coach. So, all right, so he knew what he was doing. Yeah, I don't I don't remember doing any of the mini stuff when I was a kid. No, uh, we did Playing. we did lots of really dumb stuff that <laughs> I, I we used to do the eight hour practices in a day. And I, I couldn't even tell you what we, how we spent eight hours. I can't even think of eight hours worth of stuff other than it must have been one person working and then waiting 20 minutes until the next, the next time to do something. But, um, but we did play a one-on-one setting game. I, I do remember that. You know, the horse Bucky that was the originator of that mini volleyball. Um, yes. A book out on it. I, I think that's one of the things we, we really are missing out in many places in the world is utilizing that for, for children. Mm-hmm. Because in the United States, I think that concept of maybe putting a, a rope across the gym and not using the regulation nets, but having all the children practice at one time is a good concept, but that concept is not accepted as well here. So you do, you just don't see that in an American gym because of the nice nets and the nice gym floor. But I think we're really, really missing out on teaching young children how to play the game, not utilizing some of those concepts that Horace Bakke had. Great. Agreed. I've, I've gotten into discussions about this with people. Just even the structure of of junior volleyball below fourteen and unders, and and why we sh- why we're still playing six v six with those kids. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Okay, some of them you can make the case. Yeah, they're they're probably the more physically mature kids, and they're they're prepared for it. But a bunch of ten year olds, come on, just let them let them get a bunch of contacts and play with their friends. Anyway. Uh, anything we haven't talked about in the history of volleyball that we'd like to t- toss in there before we wrap this up? Nothing jumps to mind that we uh, that we've missed out on this time, other than obviously we've hardly even scratched the surface. But right. Right. we've uh, we've had a fun conversation about some things, including history. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's hey, exactly that's why I call them conversations. Not lectures. <laughs>